Hello dear students, I am Dr. Zubair Shanib Bhatt. I welcome you all with an Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Today the topic of my talk is handling clinical specimens, methods and techniques. I divided this uh, into two parts based on its length. So today we will be talking about part one. This lecture is particularly intended, intended for the students of uh, MLT third year. So let's begin. So if I ask you, if I start with a question that uh, what is a clinical specimen? So what will be your answer? Okay, so what is a specimen, particularly when you are talking about clinical specimen? So clinical means which has something to deal with the humans. Okay. Okay, so now what is a specimen or you can alternative call it as a sample. So if you go by the dictionary terminology, uh, it, it represents a portion or a quantity of a human material. Okay, so that is to be collected first, labeled, stored for a particular period of time until you examine it. If you need to transport it, you can transport it to some other places if the facility is not available. Then finally examined and the final thing you had to do is you had to report the results. Okay. So if I tell you that a patient comes uh, to your clinical microbiology lab and he's having three forms with him, one of them is he has a registration card of the hospital that is skims in which you can find the registration number of the patient then he has a requisition form okay in which the doctor has prescribed what kind of uh, tests you are supposed to do and finally he has the payment slip with him so he has already paid for the tests so now he comes to your clinical microbiology lab and hands over you these three papers. So what are you supposed to do is you need to first document it all in your registry. Okay, so document documentation is very important so that you can report back. So now, now in current times it's being done digitally but you have to be very careful while you are doing this thing so once a patient comes to you what are you going to do with the specimen if you collect it so the menomentics i have formed for you is you are supposed to cluster your specimen what do you mean by this i will repeat it again you need to cluster your sample so let me tell what it means for you and how it can help you. The first thing is you have to collect the sample. The C stands for collection. The second thing is you need to label it. So once you collect and label it, you will put it in this kind of a tube. That's what U stands for. You will store it for a time period unless you get time to examine. You will transport it to the other labs for other biochemical tests. You will examine it and once everything is done, you will prepare a report and give it directly to the patient who has come to you for the testing. So he will come to your lab twice. Okay. Now, if you handle these clinical samples, handling plays a very important role. Because if you don't handle the samples properly, the reporting can be wrong and that is going to have an effect on the patient. Okay. So be careful while handling your samples or specimens. So as far as the cluster formula is there, so first thing of the cluster is C. So you need to collect your specimen. If I give an example of one specimen, for example, if a patient is coming and the, in the requisition form, you have the blood tests recommended by the physician. So what will you do in this case? So we'll collect this specimen first. You will label it, you will collect it in this kind of a tube in which there will be anticoagulants present. Then you will store them when the turn comes up for that sample. So you need to 
storage media for that then you can transport the sample once you have uh, taken the sample you should collect it in a very enough quantity so that the other tests can also be done so you will transport it to the other labs and putting them in the transport media and then as a microbiology as a clinical microbiologist what you are supposed to do if the a doctor has uh, written microbiological text, uh, microbiological uh, tests. So in this case, you can, you will have to do the staining. You have to do the microscopy. It can be sometimes recommended that you have to do the culture, then antimicrobial susceptibility tests, and rest of the sample. You can send it to the biochemical, uh, bio, uh, clinical biochemistry lab to do all the biochemical assays. You can transport and give it to the immunology lab so that they can do uh, other kinds of tests. For example, they can do uh, antigen antibody interaction text, uh, uh, tests. They can uh, do immunoglobulin E test, which is responsible for eliciting the allergy and many other tests like ELISA, that is immunosorbent assay, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or they can suggest here that is reagenic antigenic okay and they can also the physician can also ask for molecular analysis for example uh, using PCR and knowing about its uh, genetic material so many different uh, organisms have their specific sequences in their genes which are used or you can say it uh, they are actually uh, used for uh, the, uh, you know identifying that bacteria or a fungi okay fine so when the, all the things are done finally a report is prepared so that's what R stands for so let me again re remind you what the minomedics is so C stands for the collection L stands for the labeling S stands for the storage T stands for transport E stands for examination and R finally stands for reporting. Okay, so once you report it, then the physician will prescribe a particular uh, antimicrobial therapy or whether it's antifungal, anti antiviral. So it all depends on a clinical microbiologist, how he will handle the specimen. And that's what where your role comes in. So if, I t if you are a clinical microbiologist, you are a specialist. Because all other techniques which are being done uh, in this in these samples, they are automated. For example, many biochemical tests are automated today. Immunological tests are automated. Molecular analysis tests are also uh, uh, you know automated. So only where the human's intervention is needed, that is you, a clinical microbiologist, because still a human hand is needed for many of the things. Okay, so this is what makes the basic building block of any specimen that comes to your lab okay now talking about clinical diagnosis so the main purpose when a patient comes to a physician so he examines him and general examination and he gives him some tests to do so the test comes to your lab and then you had to report about it so if there is a problem in either testing or either in reporting, it will have very bad consequences for the patient. So being a human being, there are errors. You can make errors, but you can learn also with what you have learned. Okay, so experience matters here. The more you work in your lab, the more experience you will get and the more proper handling you can do with the specimens. So all diagnostic information from the clinical microbiology laboratory where you will be working inshallah is dependent is particularly dependent on the quality of the specimen. If the quality is not good and the quantity is not enough, the sample can be rejected by other, uh, you know, other labs. Okay. So in this case, you have to be very careful. So it means if you have poorly collected the sample or it's poorly transported, and there is a problem 
will come when you when you will fail in isolating a particular causative agent or identifying it which is causing a disease in the patient okay and at the same time you have to keep in mind that no contamination should come so in this case contamination means any other bacteria or any other whether it's an aerial bacteria or it's a bacteria on your skin it should not come in touch with the specimen okay so this is what is called normal microflora it's on your skin it's on your it's in your gastrointestinal tract it's in your uh, it's in your oral cavity i mean your mouth it's in your gastrointestinal tract so you have to be very careful not to contaminate your specimen which is a pathogenic microbe with your normal microflora now this can lead to improper diagnosis if it is done wrongly and wrong treatment for the patient so and humans lives matter and so do you matter okay because if you are a professional it can make a lot of difference for you and your society so all the procedures addressed in this lecture are for the general physicians the nurses and the medical laboratory assistants or any clinical microbiologist who be working in a clinical microbiology lab okay let's move ahead so first of the thing in your formula or i can say your minomedics is c that stands for collection so in collection we can usually use different kinds of things you can use sterile cups like this one okay it's sterile it can be made sterile by irradiating it with gamma rays or uv rays so it comes to your lab in a sterile form with a with a, this uh, cap over there and seal seal is present there so you can uh, do use sterile cups for collecting the sputum the sputum is the mucus that is present in your patient's bronchi and lungs don't confuse it with the saliva because saliva is coming from salivary glands so be very much sure about it that you are not taking the saliva of the patient but the sputum another uh, thing that you can store or collect is you using sterile cups is stool and then urine now you can also use sterile swabs particularly for throat and snares right uh, shown in, in this picture in in this covid uh, pandemic most of the uh, samples are uh, taken from the patients in the form of sterile swabs so they put it in the nose and they take the sample okay or they can just put it in the throat and collect the sample now third technique that's used for collection of the samples is called needle aspiration so needle you can understand we have to punch the needle in in the patient's uh, vein and then aspirate means just suck it out of uh, there so for that we uh, the samples that can be collected by needle and uh, sorry needle aspiration is blood one of the most commonly collected specimen in our lab cerebrospinal fluid that's the spinal fluid present in our vertebral column the pus that is the when the infection happens and our immune uh, response comes in it is actually the carcasses of the neutrophils and other cells that makes pus another thing you can uh, do with the needle aspiration is you can collect samples from the wounds and the abscesses so abscesses in kashmiri we call it pfeffer pfeffer is like uh, it's in, inside a skin but uh, you know it, it it has an inflammation on its uh, surrounding and it can be very painful at the same time so needle aspiration you can you should use it for collecting blood cerebrospinal fluid pus wounds and abscesses now coming to the catheters uh, we can directly collect the urine specimen from a person who can voluntarily give it but if it is not able to, if, if if it is a child a newborn or if it, if it is a patient uh, of prostate or of any surgical intervention has been done so you need to collect it directly from the urinary bladder and that is possible by using catheters okay now coming to the uh, another term is intubation so in means inside and two means putting the tube inside so in case of your coronavirus patients uh, tracheal intubation is done like this so 
this is done so that the patient can be then put on the ventilator and connect it, uh, connect him to the ventilator so that the the oxygen is pushed inside the lungs because the patient doesn't have its own ability to uh, get in oxygen. Okay, we can also use intubation uh, to get uh, samples from the stomach stomach of the patient. Particularly, uh, it is used for detecting H. pylori, that is Helicobacterium pylori which is responsible in much of the cases for um, peptic, I mean the stomach ulcers, stomach ulcers, okay, and uh, even uh, stomach ulcers. And recently, uh, many studies have come up which is showing that this H. pylori can be one of the reasons for causing stomach cancer. So, this is about intubation. In this case also you put a if, if it is a patient and you can put uh, the tubes that is called a levine tube uh, through the uh, through his nostrils and so that it uh, goes inside his uh, I mean uh, stomach okay or you can push it uh, if, if a patient is able to swallow it that's good but if it's not then you have to put it through the nose okay now coming to labeling that's the L of the cluster so we are talking here about this L that is labeling part that is labeling so each sample must have a label firmly attached to it okay and to the specimen container if you have a specimen container that also should be labeled bearing the following information so these are the two pictures I collected from the internet for you so in case of blood you will find a tube like this when you uh, you know collect the blood it will have anticoagulants inside like heparin and sodium and uh, sodium sodium citrate okay so this has two benefits one the blood will not uh, coagulate second it will not trap any microorganisms that are present in the patient's specimen so nowadays uh, this thing is being done it's a current uh, i mean trend that you put a tag on the patient's back and then you put the same tag on the sample so there will be no you know cross reporting okay so all is done by the scanners and it is uh, the information is fed into the computers so what you are supposed to check is on the requisition form as well as on the um, uh, hospital card is the date and the time of collection you should put in in your uh, i mean your notebook which you are putting in in your lab okay so you will put a date you will put a time for example today's date is say around uh, if it is 17 so you'll put like that and you will put a time and the time of collection so important thing is in many of the cases you don't put the patient's name so patient's name is very important so it may come, consist of three letters for example for me it is Zubair Shane but so you should put the whole name there because sometimes patients may have a common name now very important thing to uh, note here is the hospital registration number it can be a six digit number or a seven digit number you had to note it in your uh, uh, you put it on the specimen as well as in your notebook and uh, compare it with the requisition form and the patient's uh, you know uh, registration form you also should put the dob the date of birth of the patient the age or the age of the patient and you should also note down the site of the culture where you have taken the culture and finally you should put your initial out there that i am the one who has collected the uh, specimen now then once you have done that you should match all the details of the specimen with the requisition form as well as uh, as well as as the card that is that has been filled by the physician okay okay Now, moving on to the next slide, the third one is, we will ignore the U here because U stands for the tube, okay? So now we will be talking about storage. So for example, uh, if, you, if you are collecting the sample and uh, then uh, the turn of the patient is not coming up because you are already, you know, burdened with um, many of the samples. So what you will do is you will try to refrigerate it 4 degrees Celsius, then this is the refrigeration has a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius and then if you put it in a freezer it has a temperature of around minus 20 degrees Celsius. 
So if you if there is a tissue and you want to store it for a very longer time, then you should put it in a deep deep freezer where the you know temperatures can be around minus seventy. And if you have a biopsy and uh, you had to save it for a very long time, so then you can uh, put them uh, in a wax-like structures, and then these can be put in the liquid nitrogen, which has a liquid nitrogen, which has a temperature of around minus one ninety two degrees Celsius. So it's like if you touch it, your hand will get stuck to it. So you have to be very careful in this case if you have to store for any sample for a very long time and that's not necessary in the clinical microbiology lab it is particularly in the in the biopsy cases okay now for storage uh, you have to you know you have to base all your uh, collection on the storage okay so it's a very important criteria when you collect the samples and if it's not been examined early so you need to store it and for that you need storage media that's what I was talking about uh, once uh, one of your uh, CRs have complained about it that uh, the media uh, lecture is not you know for you so that's why I'm, I'm just such, uh, again stressing upon this so you should go through that lecture so that you can you can understand that better that the, the name of the lecture is uh, culture media okay now coming back so media is used for storing the bacteria for a longer period of time. For example, there are two kinds of media that can be used. One is egg saline media and another is uh, chalk co cooked meat broth and broth means liquid. Okay, so both can be uh, stored in a liquid form. So as far as egg saline media is used, it is used for preserving cultures of particularly gram negative bacteria. Always I give an example of gram negative bacteria as E. coli. It is one of the very well studied bacteria among all the bacteria so far. It's a gram negative bacteria. It's a bacilli in structure. And now coming to the T. So coming to the T is transportation. So sometimes once you have collected the sample, you have labeled it properly. Now you have prepared this is your sample now and you will store it in a refrigerator for some time until you you have you have the time to examine it and then if 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 you have to send it to other labs so you need to transport it so for that you need a transport media okay so this media the transport media is used when the specimen cannot be cultured soon so if you are not uh, you don't have enough time to culture this uh, sample so just uh, keep it in a transport uh, media for example, the two most all uh, three most common uh, storage media are that is carry Blair medium, Ames medium, Ames medium, and Strauss medium. So, the Romans carry Blair medium. It is a semi-solid medium. So, the mediums can be of three types. One, it can be a liquid. Another, it can be solid, and another, it can be in the form of a gel. So, we call it as semi-solid. So it is a semi-solid uh, media. Most of the transport media are semi-solid. So it's recommended for use in transportation and preservation of the primary stool samples and the swabs taken from the rectum of the patients. So this medium has a low nutrient content so that it, it doesn't allow the replication of the bacteria but uh, gives it uh, some time, some nutrients to maintain its viability. It means viability stands for to keep it alive. Okay. So sometimes we starve the bacteria to keep them alive so that we can test them. But if they multiply, then the testing will be, uh, you know, difficult. So this, these kinds of media are called bacteriostatic media. Static means they will not kill the bacteria, okay, but they will just slow down their replication. Because microbes, uh, you know, when they replicate, they grow in exponential form, not like they don't multiply like two, four, you know. 8, 16, they multiply like 10 is for 1 is 1, 10 is for 2 is 100, 10 is for 3 is 1000. Similarly, they so they grow very rapidly. So in order to stop that growth, we can use a uh, media which can just keep them alive but uh, not, not allow them uh, to replicate. So this one of the uh, one of them is the carry, uh, carry Blair media okay now coming to the transportation about the second media is the amice media so this amice media is an uh, improved transport media 
So imbrut means it can sustain the bacteria for a better longer time. So it particularly contains charcoal. And what does charcoal do? So you might have seen charcoal face washes are there very common in the market for males. Charcoal face washes. So what does the charcoal do? So it just uh, you know it it, pro it prolongs the viability of the pathogenic uh, microorganisms. Uh, so that uh, they remain alive for a particular period of time until they are tested. But in case of the face washes, their role is to just clean out the dust from your face. Okay. So again, I told you that for tra most of the transportation media are semi-solid. So this is also a semi-solid media and it's recommended for use in qualitative procedures. So for uh, tra transport of clinical swab specimens to the laboratory. So these are the two pictures of the, uh, I mean, the charcoal media, which is particularly has a black semi-solid storage media. So when you put the sample in, you have to pinch this side so that the charcoal comes out and it mixes with the sample. So the sample can be stored in, I mean, transported in this way. Okay. Now another media that's also used for transportation is the straw transport media. It is a non-nutritional media. Again, in this case, we don't provide much nutrients to the uh, microbes so that they, they won't grow, uh, which maintains the viability. That is, they keep them alive only. It means we keep them on fasting. Same the way when in, in Maharamzan, we keep ourselves uh, uh, fasting for uh, uh, from the sunrise to sun, sunset. The same thing we can do with the bacteria if we just don't allow them to grow so it has uh, okay the smaller agar content provides a semi-solid consistency so if you want to prepare a semi-solid uh, material so it's a, it's a combination of uh, solid as well as the liquid so this agar is actually uh, derived from uh, red algae red algae and it's made up of polysaccharide polysaccharide and many other other uh, things okay so uh, you can say that uh, the agar provides the consistency to the media it means it provides it to be a little bit uh, you know gel like and it also it does two things it, pre it, it prevents the oxidation and the drying of the samples so if this specimen dries out it's very difficult then to test it uh, or send it to the other labs for testing so you should be aware with these kinds of uh, media so, so these are three starts media aims media and the one more media i discussed uh, in the beginning so in this case you in this case you are using these swabs and then put them back once you collect the specimen you put it back into this and then you seal the cap so this is uh, particularly done uh, right now for covid patients okay Now coming to the examination part, it is one of the most important part in after collection and here it stands collection, labeling, you is a tube, storing it, transporting it and now examining it before you report it to the physician. So as a microbiologist, you, you will be having to, you will be, uh, you should be able to do gram staining. So it is an important part of your uh, work in clinical microbiology. So you will be able to know whether it's a gram negative strain or whether it's a gram positive strain. So usually when you uh, put a stain on the uh, culture on the slides, you will see that uh, the gram positive, uh, you know, bacteria, they retain uh, the color that is purple. So when you give it a uh, acid alcohol wash, they retain the color purple because they have a thick peptidoglycan layer. As compared to gram-negative bacteria, because they have just a thin peptidoglycan layer, when you wash it with acid alcohol, they lose the color. And then you counter-stain it again, and that counter-stain gives them a pink color. So these are pink in color. Another type of staining you can do in your microbiology lab is particularly zeal nacelle uh, staining. It is particularly done in mycobacterial, mycobacterial, mycobacterium lab mycobacterium tuberculosis lab okay because this mycobacterium tuberculosis causes uh, t 
TB so that's how it's named so myco means fungi like and bacteria means bacteria so it has in uh, characteristics of bro both prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes so it adds uh, to the pathogenicity of this micro so it's called myco my myco particularly used in fungi and bacteria so it's a fungi like bacteria so as such it doesn't uh, you it cannot uh, it doesn't give any uh, you know the, the your uh, gram staining will not work on it so what do you have a special staining technique for it that's called zeal nelson staining okay zeta staining where you use a, a dye called carbol fusion okay and then you follow the steps and finally you will get uh, they are pink uh, in color you so you will find pink rods when you do the microscopy okay so this is another important kind of staining that uh, a clinical microbiologist is supposed to know about now once you have prepared stained your uh, i mean your uh, sample and then you have also uh, done uh, so when when the color is there on the slide so thing, next important thing is microscopy so you put this slide under the microscope and you will find that this these are your objective lenses because they are very close to the object that's your specimen so they can have a varying uh, degree of magnification they can be 40x they can be hundred x. They can be hundred x. So we can use these. We can rotate them, and we can use different uh, kinds of uh, magnification uh, objective lenses. So if you can use a forty x uh, lens, it, it is very away from the specimen. But if you use this hundred x objective lens, it will be very close to the specimen, and it will give you more better, uh, you know, uh, view of the bacteria. Okay. So there are different kinds of microscopes. The most commonly used microscope in clinical microbiology lab is the bright field binocular microscope. It is a bright field means uh, if 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 this is the bacteria, so the field that's on this whatever you see around is bright. So we call this bright field binocular because nowadays we have microscopes which have two eye pieces. So that's how we call it as a binocular microscope. We also have a dark field microscope where the field is dark but the microorganism is illuminated. We also have a phase contrast microscope where you can see microorganisms which are alive. You can see them alive because staining kills the microorganisms. So the choice if you want to see the microorganisms alive, so you have to use this phase contrast microscopy. Then comes the turn of fluorescence microscopy. Fluorescence microscopy uses fluorescence as a source of light and you can view that also so you should be knowing i will i will put a different lecture on microscopy because it's very important for the microbiology lab so uh, this will be a, i will put in different uh, very uh, detailed um, video on this microscope another important thing as a microbiologist is you had you may the doctor may advise a microbial culture particularly urine culture and there are many other cultures that can be you know suggested by a physician so you should know about all the things how to which media is, uh, is supposed to use for one particular uh, you know for a particular pathogen so that's why please and please go through these lectures that's the the culture the types of cultures which uh, which i have done previously it's uh, available on the youtube channel another thing as a uh, I, uh, clinical microbiologist you have to perform this antibiotic susceptibility test or you can also call it as antibiotic sensitivity test so in this case what you want to see is if, if a patient comes and he's being given a medicine say for example an antibacterial medicine and he's not responding to the drugs okay so what the patient will be suggested is this antimicrobial sensitivity test so uh, different antimicrobials will be used for this uh, pathogen and the one drug which can kill it or which can you know stop its replication the doctor will recommend that drug only so as a microbiologist you have to be aware with this technique now coming to this biochemical assays there are different assays can be done or they can be suggested but you have to send the samples to the biochemistry clinical biochemistry lab you have to send them to the immunological lab you have to send it to the molecular genetic lab so that if a physician has suggested it you can transport it 
so in case of antimicrobial acid testing you have to be very careful you have to work within this cabinet so this is called biosafety biosafety cabinet and it has different levels based on the organism you are working with so we have biosafety cabinets one two and three so based on the pathogenicity if you have if you are working with a virus or mycobacterium tuberculosis so you have to use this biosafety level three cabinet as well as the room should be uh, you know uh, biosafety it should also have a biosafety level okay so in, in these cases most common filters that are used to clean the air that is coming in contact is called HIPAA filter so HIPAA filters what they do is they clean the air within the uh, I mean your uh, this uh, biosafety cabinet and you can work inside and there is like a shower of air comes like this from the top and this stops the air of the room in coming to the place where you are working so you should ensure that while you work with microorganisms you work in biosafety cabinets to ensure that it is safe for your safety as well as uh, for preventing any contamination while you are examining or any doing any antimicrobial test on the sample specimens of the patients okay most particularly two people are needed one can work here and if he needs anything the other another can help him around so when i was in phd we, we, we were two friends and we both worked like this one was working and one has to provide the assistance so in this case we used to uh, you know uh, change our uh, i mean uh, change our uh, seats okay now coming to the biochemical assays that's the reason why i told you in the beginning that you should collect enough of the sample in case of blood you should be able to take uh, around four to five ml of the blood so that uh, all the other tests which have been recommended by the physician can be done so in biochemical uh, assays uh, a doctor can suggest a kidney function test okay kft lft liver function test he can uh, 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 do a complement test blood complement test he can suggest uh, a patient for uh, you know uh, white blood cell analysis okay all the cells red blood cells whatever there are he can suggest for that so it is you who is transporting them sometimes a patient if he doesn't have to do with any microbes so he can directly go to the biochemical lab but you are the one who, who should have a knowledge of these essays because having a knowledge is good but having a technique is better than that so that technique is a manual technique which as a clinical microbiologist only you know so that adds value to you okay as compared with other students who are working in biochemical labs or immunological techniques or molecular biology because most of their work is done automated by automated machines still that's a technique but you are you are you know clinical microbiology has a more laborious manual work to do and then you will become a particular microbiologist clinical microbiologist so a tag will be added to your name and people require clinical microbiologists very often particularly in this scenario of covid uh, testing if you are a clinical microbiologist so people will require you more so you you can value addition your career okay so in case of immunological tests uh, it can be a test for immunoglobulin e which is uh, responsible for allergy okay it can be a test for seeing uh, other uh, immunological problems within the patients in case of you want to know, detect which kind of bacteria if you are not able in culture if you, if, if the multiple uh, organisms grow and you are not able you are not ensure you know you are not sure enough to say whether this is the bacteria that's this is the bug that's causing the disease so you will send it to the molecular uh, lab so what they will do is they will do its dna analysis particularly by using a technique of pcr polymerase chain reaction it's nothing but a reaction that is it's a replica of a replication what happens inside us or the other microorganisms okay so we replicate the dna so that we can have much of the uh, dna and then we analyze it by different immuno, immuno i mean molecular techniques okay now coming to the reporting part so once you have 
collected the sample very carefully you have labeled it this is your sample now standing in your lab you store it in a refrigeration for some time then you can transport it as fast as possible as speedy, speedy as possible by using transport medias you examine it by using different techniques and finally comes the turn of reporting so what will you do in the reporting part so first of all you will see here the patient's name is not there so this is not the way the patient's name should be written in detail so lab number here in this case you can write the lab number your lab number or you should have a patient's registration number here the skims registration number written on the card of the patient then the age should also be mentioned the complete name as i told you if it's a three letter name my name is zubair shane but mention all the three okay then the gender here is written unknown so it's not a way to do that so you have to write the gender here this part is okay received is okay reported is okay status it's okay good now referred by again this is not the way you should write who which doctor has referred this test to him and the cvc the most commonly done test for the blood cultures is a complete blood complement where you find where you find the levels of different cells in case of infections most of the time the levels of the neutral i mean white blood cells increases because they are fighting an infection so a doctor comes to know this by a test called as blood complement uh, blood uh, sorry complete blood count cbc so while reporting i'm just i've just put a, a figure of uh, this uh, covid test okay and then you have to check out when you have a requisition form you should check out the things which doctor has uh, you know put in there so usually doctor uh, leaves a space because he doesn't require all the tests for for example so he ticks it here and he doesn't use this so you have to do only these two tests which are being you know ticked by the physician okay so reporting is now being done digitally so you will also use it while you are working in your lab now coming to the topic of how to collect the samples different ways of collecting the samples one of them is sterile cups so if you have to check the sputum of a patient to see whether it is having any kind of uh, disease particularly sputum is collected in a disease called tuberculosis caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis okay sputum is used for many other uh, uh, diagnostic uh, diagnosing many other bacteria okay from which are present in your, in your sputum when many of the bacteria which can you know cause respiratory diseases for example pneumococcus so in that that case you need to you need a sputum sample so this is being collected in a very specialized kind of a uh, cup so when the patient spits out here the sputum seeps between this and it remains here so when you are collect you are getting this sample in your clinical microbiology lab you just open the lid on the lower side and the clinical sample will drop into the your workplace okay so you had to uh, make the patient expurgate the sputum because i told you that if he if you if he only gives you saliva and that saliva is coming from salivary glands so that is of no use to you so you have to make the patient cough and this sputum specially designed cup allows the patient to expurgate expectorate you might have seen there are some cough syrups which they which, which label as they are for dry cough they are for they are, sometimes it's written on the label expectorant expectorant which is used for cough where we have sputum along with it so you have to make him uh, you know cough and collect the sputum in this specially designed cup in the laboratory the cup can be opened as i told you from the bottom and so that it can reduce the uh, chances of contamination by other organisms okay so you will only be getting the specimen 
in a very sterile manner. So all uh, sputum samples uh, are contaminated to varying uh, to a varying degree. Um, particularly when you are using you are collecting that uh, these oropharyngeal excretions. So what there are some techniques you can reduce this contamination. That is, you first you can make a patient to renaise uh, his mouth. That's called mechanical renaising. And immediately before he will uh, export it, it will reduce the number of contaminating bacteria. Another thing is the patient should renaise his mouth uh, before uh, he gives the specimen. So what will it do is it will remove all the other microorganisms, uh, normally normal microflora which is present in your oral cavity so that it doesn't mix up with the sputum. The patient should be uh, instructed to uh, by a direct supervision. So you should be there while he cuffs so you can see whether he is really giving a, uh, uh, I mean sputum or he is giving saliva. And uh, it, he should, uh, you should be able to collect a single bolus of the exporant in a sterile wide mouth cup that I showed you on the top of the slide. Now comes the turn of the stool specimen. Stool specimen is also collected in sterile uh, cups. Okay, so the laboratory may routinely screen uh, these stool specimens for the presence of Shigelia, Salmonella, which causes Salmonella typhi, Campylobacter, which is present in the stool cultures. And but you you, you should not use this sterile cup for uh, detecting uh, Yersinia or Vibrio specimens because there are other techniques available for them. Okay, so prolonged transport st uh, stools for uh, for if you want to see there if they are present the trophozoites are there present in the stool. So uh, stools for uh, trophozoites one hour since collection from the soft uh, formed or you can so it means it's telling us that it should be uh, transported uh, it can if it's prolonged so you can put it in a transport media or uh, it, for but that will be viable for around one hour or half an hour for culture feces should be passed directly into a sterile wide mouth cup with a tight leak proof cover that is the cap if the specimen is collected off-site means you have not the patient has himself uh, put the you know his tool in the container uh, it should be transferred immediately to a, uh, to a clary player medium that's a transport medium okay as we have seen in the previous slide so uh, it will make uh, the uh, bacteria remain viable the pathogenic one and uh, not allow the other microorganisms to grow okay so if it's a uh, clostridium in case of clostridium difficult which is a noso which causes a nosocomial infection that is it's in it's in hospital acquired infections these uh, clostridiums can make spores and they, these spores sit on the tables and they sit on the handles and what it does is it causes uh, uh, you know uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea this clostridium uh, difficult so it also because of screening some toxins so if you want to detect uh, this if, the, if it is present in the patient's sample so this toxin test is ordered by the physician of course and it must be ordered separately you cannot uh, it should be ordered on a separate requisition form okay now coming to the next slide so now what are the different medias which where you can culture the stool and culturing is a role of a clinical microbiologist that's you okay so that's why i stress on the, so going back to the last lecture and study these kinds of media so briefly I will tell it that carry blair media it's used as a transport media it's a semi-solid media for uh, stool so that uh, Salmonella, Shigelia, Vibrio or Campylobacteria species can be detected. So for, we also have Campylobacteria separate medium. It's a selective medium. Selective medium means it favors the growth of one particular bacteria as compared to the others. Okay. So if you put antibiotic against it. So if you put something uh, in, in that selective media, so that will prevent the growth of other microbes, but will selectively favor the growth of the one particular microorganisms. So this is used for uh, to isolating Campylobacter jejunum, which is present in your large intestine, because your large intestine has three parts, one of them is jejunum, uh, Campylobacter coli from the stool sample. So we also have a special uh, medium for Salmonella shigelia, that's called Salmonella shigelia agar, it's a solid media. 
and it's also a selective media it again favors only the growth of salmonella and shigeria and it's used to isolate the salmonella shigeria from stool samples and this is in short it's called ss agar uh, if, if we add additional bile salts to it so it can be used uh, to uh, detect yersinia enterococcus in, in the suspected patients okay as i told you before that uh, this test should be ordered separately another media that is used for a stool is uh, thiosulfate citrate bile source that is tc uh, tcbs agar again it's a solid media and again the name is selective selective means it favors the growth of only this kind of bacteria that is vibrio cholera that causes cholera it's a common shaped bacteria it's a gram negative bacteria which is common shaped in structure and other vibrio species from the stool so cholera used to means that's like a dysentery okay another media that can be used for uh, culturing the stool is uh, xld media that's a xylose lysine uh, deoxycholate media lysine is one of the basic amino acids and uh, xylose can be a polysaccharide so it's a, again a selective media only favors the growth of shigelia and is used to isolate salmonella and shigelia species from the stool specimen okay moving to the next slide now another important uh, and very frequent uh, sample that you receive in your laboratories is the urine so it is, uh, that's called routine urine test so what is happening is in many of the uh, cases it is uh, this routine culture is for detecting detecting the urinary tract infections that is caused by different kinds of bacteria most frequently they occur in the females yes males also have sometimes this urinary tract infection but it's more prevalent in females during their pregnancy and during their uh, you know uh, menstrual cycles so for that urine uh, routine urine culture uh, voluntary samples if they are being given means a patient is able to voluntarily give the sample of urine so you before doing that the patient should be advised to clean uh, clean the area so this method of collection is called clean and catch media okay so you can give him an ethanol swab so that he uh, he or she can clean uh, the genitals after that you can uh, you know catch the urine part so while in case of involuntary specimens we definitely uh, need a catheter so uh, if 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 we have to uh, take a urine from the uh, uh, newborn so you cannot you they cannot give a voluntary specimen so for that you have to put a catheter inside their uh, you know urinary bladder and collect the specimen directly from the urinary bladder so i will be talking about it also so let, let us first talk about this uh, you know routine urine so after the patient has uh, cleansed uh, his uh, you know uh, genitals particularly uh, in females the, the urethral meatus or that is the opening a small container is used to collect the urine so each early morning uh, specimens are uh, better okay so the volume that you should be uh, the patient should be able to give is around 10 to 50 ml 50 ml and we can then we can uh, make this technique more efficient that's called clean and catch midstream method that is what is this so first you you give uh, alcohol swabs or any cleaning agent to a patient he cleans his genitals then you catch the midstream of this uh, of the urine it means he will urinate first and he will once he is urinating during the uh, urination you will he will collect some part of the urine so that's called clean and catch midstream method okay so that should be collected in a clean uh, polypro uh, polypropylene container and seal the specimen container and label it properly. So the urine specimens that will not be processed within the 24 hours, I told you that they should be stored uh, at 2 to uh, 8 degrees Celsius. In these cases, you don't need any storage media in the in case of urine. So urine samples uh, may also be transported if, uh, if you don't have the facility here. So, but uh, the, it, it keeps it uh, stable for around 24 hours. More than 24 hours, uh, you should take a new specimen from the patient. Okay. Okay. Now, as I told you, those who cannot give voluntary, uh, you know, urine samples, uh, another very important technique in case of collection is using catheters. So, it is used for, I mean, the newborns, newborn patients. Catheter can be used while a patient has been just come out of the surgery. He cannot voluntary and he can, you know, wet his bed. So again, 
catheters is used because uh, in case of the uh, patients who have uh, received any surgery okay because they are unconscious at that time during the surgery and most of the time uh, you know they cannot get up from the bed so the catheters can be attached then they can easily, easily urinate another uh, way the uh, catheters are used for uh, patients uh, you know who have some uh, you know uh, any kind of uh, problem particularly uh, uh, in males uh, there's a condition called prostate prostate cancer so the, these people also have to be inserted with the catheters because once the uh, prostate cancer happens it you know if, if, it, if it is your uh, if it is the duct of the pipeline of the urine so prostate gland is here so what it does is when it gets inflamed it sticks this uh, place so the person cannot voluntarily uh, do urination in that cases definitely we need the catheters okay so let us see so what is a catheter it is a tubular instrument okay it is used for withdrawing or introducing fluids directly from the urinary bladder here we can use uh, this catheter okay so for example urinary samples may be collected with the catheters to detect urinary infections that are caused by bacteria and they are directly collected from the urinary bladder so three types are commonly used for urine there are three kinds of catheters one is hard catheter it means the patient will have uh, to feel and bear the pain while they insert it that's the reason when the uh, urethra is very narrow as i told you in case of prostate uh, cancer patients they particularly uh, give this hard catheter okay another is the french catheter it is a little bit soft easy for the patients to bear the pain and but it is used for only collecting a single specimen of the urine now most widely used is the folic, uh, folic uh, catheter in uh, patients who have to you know be, uh, be on uh, keep on wearing this catheter for a long time so if multiple samples are required or over a prolonged period of time the most commonly used then catheter is called the folic catheter uh, sorry folic catheter because the folly it was the folly who discovered this okay so this is a uh, simple drawing of a folic catheter so you can see it it has a push-up pump like this and it has three different openings it is inserted through the penis and then once it until it reaches your urinary bladder it's very painful uh, and then what are the, uh, the importance of these three pores here so first one of them it has a round sh shaft at the top as i told you it's here then three different pipelines one is for uh, drainage of urine so you can collect it another is infl inflation or because once you put it in it, it will come it can come out again so you have to inflate it third is you can introduce uh, irrigating solutions for the urinary depilator in order to you know uh, clean it for some time and then once if the bacteria is again growing in so you can uh, use this uh, irrigation solution so these three kinds of uh, you know pipes are in this folies catheter too so after a catheter has been introduced in the urinary bladder the tip is particularly inflated inflated so so that it doesn't come out from the urinary bladder so i thank you all for uh, giving me time to explain things hope you have understood well if you have any comments you can just write them down on my youtube channel or you can just put it down in the whatsapp group fine all the uh, you, uh, you know whatever your suggestions uh, will be useful for me to make the next part of this lecture so uh, take be safe and be inside your homes you can revise your lectures online okay and till now till then goodbye and i will meet you in part two of this lecture thank you very much